Sergeant? Well, one, two. Hi there, Sergeant. Huh. How are you? Good. Who's a little trooper back there? Charlie? Charlie yeah. it is. Come here, man. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> I wrote out a little welcome for you lovely folks from Minnesota. And uh, I'm going to share this with you. Oh, kept your paper dry. well, fine. Well, thank you. I know it's not important to keep your powder dry. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's not the day to worry about that. That's right. That's the day to thank you for coming. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to welcome you, dear friends, to the Nashville National Cemetery. Hallowed ground and serene repose those in the state and states who served the country and are resting here for well over 150 years. Buried here also are the honored souls of the Union Army serving the nation from 1861 to 1865 in the Civil War. True, families were divided, brothers, fathers, and sons. But its ramifications go even deeper. The nation was divided by a momentous issue. The issue is still not resolved. The issue is the real reason there are nearly 2,000 black men resting here these past 150 years, taking up the mantle of wanting freedom. The war became a true beacon for these men and to help try and heal a nation. 20,000 or more black men from all walks of life in the state of Tennessee chose to stand as men in spite of the ridicule, in spite of the threats, inward and outward. Joining the rest of the over 180,000 who enlisted which comprised about 12% of the entire Union Army. In their journey, they fought in over 449 battles and engagements. Over 35,000 lost their lives. 23 of these men won the nation's highest honor, the Medal of Honor, Army and Navy. This monument means one thing and one thing only, honoring them, remembering them. The sacrifices, the pride, the dignity, selflessness, and honor. And for us, all of us here now, just to say to them, thank you. Now, I uh, won't keep you out here long, but when they ask me to be the model for this, um, I don't have to tell you, it was a big honor. And I'm a humble person. I was a fireman for 27 years in this city and retired four years ago. So when you hear people call you a hero, kind of take it with a grain of salt because you're doing your job. And I didn't feel like I was a hero. I wasn't a hero in the Vietnam War and I wasn't a hero on my job. I just help people. God put me here for a reason and that's what I do. And through my journeys and travel with this monument, it's been a, it's been a blessing, but put 
on his uniform has also been a blessing. Because it's taken me to places, done things I could never imagine. And when I talk to kids, different venues, like we had Friday, um, we had close to a thousand kids over there in Franklin come by to see us. And for African Americans to participate in this journey, I don't call it a hobby, it's a journey. A hobby is when you don't do nothing to put your stuff on and run around and shoot and act crazy and sleep out and <laughs> all of that. <laughs> you know. And we still do that, but it's, it's more to it for us. It's more to it. You know, aside from trying to help unite the, the nation and the union, we were fighting for our people that were still wearing chains here and everywhere else. And one of my ancestors, uh, he was a former slave in Virginia. And he joined the United States Colored Troops. And I'm very proud to say this, that he joined the 23 to 1 of Mel of Honor, Valley, around Richmond, a place called New Market Heights. And um, this journey, wearing this uniform, and the blessings of Almighty and His spirits, well, they guided me to reconnect with my family in Virginia because I can thank them, these guys. My mother and father, he's a World War II veteran, he's right over there, you know, my mom. When I was a kid, they would always tell me about our family history. I was a little fella. And when we had big family gatherings and everybody was eating and talking and what have you, I always ended up sitting right underneath my dad and my aunts and uncles and stuff, and they always talked about the old ones. And I heard the stories over and over and over. It was like, it's like an old African tradition. You talk about your people, you know, whatever. And so I learned things at an early age, and when I got to a place where I could really reflect on everything, Actually, when I really first started reenacting, because I was writing everything down my mom and dad were talking about. I come to realize that there was a connection between what they were talking about when I was a kid and what I was doing now. Ergo, first Sergeant Radcliffe, when I started doing this, and I'm a believer in this, I don't know if you all even care, but I'm going to tell you the God's truth. He was hanging on my shoulder when I was doing it, first started doing this, and he wouldn't turn me loose. He would not turn me loose. And it was because my dad told me some things about our family, you know, during the slave times and whatever, and I learned that <laughs> my white ancestors from Europe, they were from like north of England and Scotland, and then they came over here and they got the little plantations and what have you. And then, you know, here we come. And then uh, and I got the Cherokee blood, a little Scott, a lot of Africans. And it took me 20 years when I actually got my family line traced back to the motherland. So I know from whence I come from in West Africa, Nigeria. And, you know, I tell people you may not ever be monetarily wealthy, rich, ever. I don't care how much you struggle and try, but I tell kids when I talk to them, when you learn something about yourself, there's a richness and a treasure that's in here, in here, that nobody can ever take from you, and you will always be wealthy. But knowledge is wealth. So learning my family tree and everything, and then, <laughs> You know, First Sergeant Radcliffe, like I said, we dedicated a monument in Washington, D.C., dedicated to all the U.S. colored troops and sailors in Washington. And we were there for a week. And I was one of the ones chosen to speak at Arlington Cemetery at the Amphitheater. You know, where the President and all hang out. They got 
got me up there. So they did, they gave, they gave each of us that were going to be there five names. Soldiers and sailors from going to Mel of Honor. I guess you guys started to rap there. <laughs> I didn't ask for it. Okay? I didn't know he was even in the mix till I was getting ready to go to the microphone. I was the phone I had five. And I'm some soldier, 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 sailor. And then my first soccer they were rap with him. I was like, oh Lord, here we go. <laughs> okay, so the guy's been hanging with me. So then I met my family in Virginia. And my family is big, bigger than I ever thought. I didn't know how many rappers were even in the United States, but there's at least 50 of them in the Williamsburg, Yorktown, Hampton, Norfolk area. A third of them are in the military, uh, Army. Marine Corps, and all my cousins, all my kin. We did a battle reenactment uh, two months ago. I went back in the Richmond area. We did the battle reenactment of New Market Heights. It was totally United States Colored Troop battle. As an FYI, 16 of the 23 Medal of Honors that were won during the war were won in that fight. That's one fight. 16. And Sergeant Radcliffe led his company when the commanding officer was shot down. He was shot and killed. And so he pulled his sword, grabbed the flag, and took him over the battle. But there were 15 other men that day won the medal. So, yeah, it's a matter of pride and honor. Uh, honor and keeping the word and that kind of thing. <laughs> In this day and time, I'm sorry to say it seems archaic because, you know, I was raised to believe that your word is the word. You know, the man you give your word, you try to keep your word. However long it takes. You don't see that much anymore. And that makes me all the more determined to stay the course. They can say what they want about me, but nobody can say I haven't kept my word. So anyway, that's my little spiel. And, uh, I don't want to bore you with it, a lot of particulars and stuff. I know I'll tell you, I took over 150 pictures on that very spot before that thing was put up. But the sculptor brought me out here one day. I'm still on duty with the fire department. And I'm going to tell you this. You work 24 hours at the fire department going through whatever the heck happens. And my wife is over here. Truck, she can tell you. I picked her up after I got off duty, never got a nap, had to eat breakfast on the fly. I came out here and then I had to go to the sculpture studio. His house is over by Vanderbilt University. That's where I spent my off time. Okay? And uh, I got photos and albums at home with plaster on my face and all that stuff, you know, and two little air holes so I could breathe. And, and like, you know, hey, I took a nap. <laughs> he had a big barber chair, so I just got in and went to sleep. So him and my wife talked while he was working out and knocked out. <laughs> so they shipped the mold and all that off to a foundry in Utah. The base actually came from a uh, building down the street, a uh, company that does headstones and markers and whatnot. So that was here first. We had a little dedication ceremony for that, and then 2006, that was the day that they unveiled that thing for me. So it's one of two in the entire United States, and I say that in all humility, because there's not another one in the National Cemetery in the continental United States. And they actually put my <coughs> likeness, there's another one of these. <laughs> Uh, in Helena, Arkansas, and Helena, Arkansas was the seat of a lot of African Americans that fled from the plantations and whatnot and went to what's called a contraband camp. And it was also the site of a lot of battles uh, between uh, Union and Confederate and uh, black troops fought there. They, they had an artillery battery, battery set up there inside the Greenway. It's a beautiful Greenway. It's beautiful. And the funny thing about this, Helena, Arkansas was the home <laughs> of a Confederate general that was killed at Franklin, Patrick Claiborne. 
Okay. And I always found that kind of ironic. But, you know, uh, Claiborne was one of my favorite Confederate generals. You know, I just liked the guy. He was, he was cool, he did his job, you know, and, and uh, you know, he tried to keep the stuff down, but he did his job. And you have to know your enemy, and I have respect for him. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I know it's raining, but does anybody have any questions or anything? How did you get chosen to be the model? I wonder about that myself. Good luck. <laughs> Ma'am? Good luck. Oh, bless you. <laughs> oh, bless you. I, I, Ma'am, for a long time, and here's another humble moment, but for a long, long time, I've been doing this for the hobby journey kind of thing for the last... 26 years, and I joined the unit who made the movie Glory, and I'm a member of the 54th Massachusetts, but I'm the only guy from the 54th that lives over here in Tennessee, vis-a-vis, -vis, we call it the Western Field. So when I would go to events on the East Coast, you know, I would leave from here and then meet my guys in Washington, and then we'd take a of us and go where the heck we were going. I was it for a long time. Me, myself, and me. There wasn't any other black men acting. I would march in the veterans parade by myself. I go to Fort Negley on the anniversary of the battle, and uh, it's nice now, but back then, it looked like a, it looked like a nuclear holocaust. At the time, there was still a lot of uh, I'm going to be kind. There were a lot of people in the deep southern persuasion that wanted to leave the fort alone and let it ride away. Mm -hmm. So it was a home to the homeless and the Ku Klux Klan and people died up there mysteriously and what have you. And it had a lot of history, but on the anniversary of the Battle of Nashville, I just, that was my thing, I did it. And so <clears throat> people knew me from doing it because I was just venturing by myself and do schools and things like that and marching parades, so they, they approached me. The then director of this facility, it was his idea. He still owns, owns he did this on his own. He wanted to have something here for these men. And I knew him pretty well, and he didn't approach me directly. I had some other people, supporters that approached me. I was looking at like they were crazy. Mm -hmm. What? Me? Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that's what happened. So were you in the movie, Glory? Well, I'll put it like this. You didn't see me. No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see me. Okay. Wasn't in the camera company. And mm -hmm. you know, okay. You know, run by and hi. You know, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I've been with those guys for like, 26 years, and when we did the new market event a couple of months ago, uh, it was really wonderful to get back together with us. Uh, we are a real tight-knit group, been that way, and my brothers, I love them dearly, so, uh, you know, we do what we can, you know, uh, we're all a little older now, but everybody still has a heart for what they're doing, because there ain't that many of them. I tell people that we're the we're the Navy SEALs of reenacting. <laughs> it might be a three million man Navy, but there ain't the four hundred Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. And so like we get asked and requested to do a lot of things here locally and in Alabama and Georgia and um, various places, you know, we do events, you know, and doing what we can. Sometimes we have to split our forces. Some go here, some go there. We do the best we can. I think we've been successful. Anybody else? Did you ever uh, make contact with Company F, 29th Infantry, United States College Troops out of Milwaukee? You know, I believe we have. I think they were in Washington as well. Okay. Uh, I'm a viewer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's your name? Bill Crowder. Bill Crowder. Bill Crowder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. they, uh, they did the research and uh, they had, of course, you knew they had white officers. Yeah, sure. But they had a, a, a white bugler for the period of time. Yeah. 
They've come stripped with me into their core, so. Hey, don't laugh. We got a white guy that joins us. So we we, we settled up and figured him out. You know, he just likes to fall in really because yeah. he knows us. Uh, he comes to a lot of our events. I said, well, okay, from now on, anybody asks you, you're Creole. <laughs> he's got he's got a story, you know, and oddly enough, the people are Cajun, all right? And um, I said, well, man, just change that to Creole, you know? <laughs> you were with the USCT down in Milliken's Bend or something. You come <laughs> it works out fine. I don't, I've only had, like, two people ask me, what's he doing with you? I said, man, Creole. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm part Scott, but I don't wear a kilt. <laughs> I'm part not, not today. <laughs> no, no, no. But anyway, that, that's okay, glad to meet you. Glad to meet you. I, I, I know some of them guys. I met them. And so <coughs> it's all been it's been great. You know, when I was on the fire department, the the fact that I was reenacting in my spare time mm -hmm. or whatever, that it knocked a lot of the stress level off. Whatever was going on, because if I knew I was going out some battle somewhere. Yep. I'm, first, I'm going to have fun because when the public's not around, we have a blast. And I'm not going to say anything more about that. <laughs> but it, it took a lot of the stress levels down. You yeah, need to do something. So that was uh, that was it. Anybody else? Who is this guy? Hello. <laughs> Anybody got any other questions? I don't want y'all to get pneumonia. I'm sure in Minnesota you're worried about pneumonia. <laughs> All right, buddy, out here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Three cheers and a tiger for the USCT. Yeah. Hip, 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 hooray! Hip, 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 hooray! Hip, 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 hooray! Thank you, guys. Thank you. You made my Sunday. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. What are the pennies for? Sir? The pennies. On... You know, I have no clue. I don't know. They may be for me. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. You could make a living. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a wish pen. <laughs> That's what I thought. It's probably because Lincoln was the great emancipator. Yeah. 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 Nashville, we're in Madison, Tennessee, and we're no longer in Williamson County, we're in uh, Davidson County, and we're about six miles from downtown Nashville. Uh, this cemetery opened in July of 1866. Now, most of the original burials here, as Bill mentioned, were reinterments from temporary hospital burying grounds, 
from battlefield graves at Nashville, Franklin, Gallatin, Tennessee, and also from Bowling Green and Cave City, Kentucky. And as you can tell here, all of the graves are laid out in these irregular sections and curvilinear avenues. Uh, this cemetery closed to new internment, internment in 1993. Now, the first thing you'll obviously notice here is that uh, the railroad cuts right through the center of the cemetery and you think, you know, what kind of fool would, would do that? But that was actually done by design. General George Thomas, the commander of the Union troops at the Battle of Nashville, helped choose this site in ultimately selecting this location on both sides of the Louisville Nashville Railroad and the Gallatin Pike that we came in on was the main road leading to the northeast. And Thomas had said of this site, no one could come to Nashville from the north and not be reminded of the sacrifices that have been made for the preservation of the Union. So he wanted all people traveling through this area to see uh, the commitment from soldiers to preserve the Union. Now this ground was established as a U.S. military cemetery in 1867. It's roughly about 65 acres, um, pretty much cut in half by the railroad, so in, in two equal uh, halves. The stone wall that you see around the cemetery and the limestone archway were all from 1870. There are a number of buildings and structures that lie on the cemetery grounds. Uh, the oldest on the site is the, on the other side, the stone block maintenance building. That dates to 1887. And the, the main building is from 1931, a Dutch colonial style house. Uh, that's always been the superintendent's house. The other feature you see here are these uh, seacoast cannons. Uh, there's five of them located throughout the cemetery. They, they don't really have any other significance other than to kind of, uh, you know, signify the different sections of the cemetery. Uh, the cemetery was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 96. And as we just saw, that, that new monument for the USCT was put up in 2006. There are about 16,500 Civil War soldiers buried here and a uh, little less than 11,000 were white soldiers and as Bill mentioned there's a total of about 2,000 African American or black troops buried here and about 1,450 of them were colored soldiers from the Civil War and also employees of the cemetery over the years are allowed to be buried here also, there are, there are no Confederate soldiers buried at this cemetery. They're all, as John mentioned yesterday, they're all buried uh, in the town of Nashville. And there never were? <coughs> there never were. Hmm. Uh, and also, there's uh, three Medal of Honor soldiers uh, buried here at the cemetery. Now, for the Minnesota Monument, you can see off to my right, back in between 1915 and 1922, Minnesota was placing monuments at several uh, national cemeteries. Uh, there's one in Little Rock National Cemetery, Memphis, Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, and also at Andersonville. So this is the, the here in Nashville is the fifth of, of five monuments placed by Minnesota at national cemeteries. So in 1919, the Minnesota State Legislature appropriated $7,500 for a monument at Nashville National Cemetery to honor the Minnesota soldiers buried here. Uh, as part of that commission, they took one soldier or one survivor of the Battle of Nashville from each of the regiments. Now before this monument could be uh, erected and dedicated, Thomas Wilson and C.F. McDonald who were on the commission passed away. And as you can see, the, the monument is a bronze statue of a female figure on a granite base. The monument was placed in 1920, and then on May 18th of 1921, at 10 a.m. in the morning, 
A delegation came here from Minnesota and dedicated the monument. They chose a, a small eight-year-old girl from Nashville to unveil the monument. And the speakers at that first dedication included the governor of Minnesota, J.A. Preuss, the governor of Tennessee, Elf Taylor, uh, Henry B. Dyke, a member of the commission and a veteran of the 5th Minnesota and a survivor of the ba Battle of Nashville was here to speak. Also Levi Longfellow, he was from the 6th Minnesota, who was not here, but he was a member of the commission after the, the soldiers from the 5th and 9th had, had died before they could place the monument. Also speaking on that day was Harrison Pond, the superintendent of the Nashville Cemetery, and General C.C. Andrews, a veteran of the 3rd Minnesota, was the master of ceremonies, and he was the chairman of the Monuments uh, Commission. Nashville Cemetery has more soldiers from different regiments and units than any other national cemetery. So, and I'm just going to read, I was going to read through the list of all of the men that are, that are buried here, but for the sake of the weather, weather we'll, we'll try to do that at Shies Hill. We'll actually read the names of all the men who, who died in the battle. But here's just a quick list of, of the men are, that are here. And, and this really uh, proves out what, what uh, we've heard about Nashville. I mean, this was a, uh, many regiments from Minnesota came through here. Many were stationed here. There was hospitals here. And that's why there's so many so Minnesota soldiers from, from different units. There, there's roughly about 165 Minnesota soldiers buried here. From the 2nd Minnesota, there's 22. From the 3rd Minnesota, 8. From the 4th Minnesota, 2. And then from the Battle of Nashville, from the 5th Minnesota, there's 34. From the 7th, 15. From the 9th, 18. And from the 10th, 28. Now these men from the from that participated in the Battle of Nashville, actually this was their third resting place they were first buried immediately after the battle basically where they fell uh, the next year they were were taken up and moved to uh, uh, near the town cemetery in Nashville and then in 1867 they were all moved here so they actually this is their third spot for the men that were killed in the Battle of Nashville uh, getting back to the list uh, from the 11th Minnesota who were stationed nearby here guarding the railroads to the northeast was the 11th Minnesota. And there's 20 soldiers from, from that regiment here. There's also 13 from the Minnesota Heavy Artillery, three from the 2nd Minnesota Battery of Light Artillery, and two from the Brackett's Battalion of Cavalry. So uh, roughly about uh, the numbers vary, but somewhere between maybe 95 and 100 soldiers that were killed at the battle, or killed or mortally wounded at the Battle of Nashville are buried here. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, we're going to go out there. We're just going to do a, a very brief rededication, place a wreath, and and come back. So we'll maybe just be out for, you know, maybe five, six, seven minutes to do a little bit of a rededication. Uh, take some photos and then come back. The ones in this community you can see are men from the 2nd, 3rd, 5th. Now if you look at any of these monuments here that put the flags on, it's not going to tell you wow, which unit they're from. But I do have the list here, so if you go look at one and you got a name and you're not sure what regiment they're in, but in this immediate vicinity again, they're from the 2nd, 3rd, and 5th. Now there's a total of about 165 Minnesota soldiers buried here. We saw the one on the other side of the road, and all of the rest are on this side. They're in, in uh, four sections here. Two of them are here, and then two of them are, are kind of on the far side. So E and F here, and G and H on the far side. And again, they are marked with flags. They're just difficult to see right now. So they weren't up here? No. no. Remember I told you they were all reinterred from somewhere else and brought in? So it kind of was based on when they came in and where they were placed. 
And also, General Thomas did say that he didn't want it to be like, like at Gettysburg. He didn't want, he wanted, they fought together. So as they died together, they were buried together. So it was kind of done by purpose that he did not want them all together. He wanted them, you know, kind of as they came in or from the battles they were. So that was done intentionally. <coughs> So I'm going to read a brief rededication statement as uh, Bryce places the monument. So similar to what we did at Gettysburg, we're going to have a descendant of a soldier who fought in the battle and place the, the wreath. So where is Bryce? Okay. We the people of Minnesota on this day, November 16, 2014, on the 93rd anniversary year of the first dedication of this monument, and on the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Nashville, rededicate this monument to honor and remember the Civil War soldiers from Minnesota who are buried here and who gave their life to preserve our country. chaplain of the 30th Division in World War I, and he read this at the 1921 dedication program. And I think it's just as fitting today as it was then, 94 years ago. And what he said was, as we come at this late hour to honor these fallen heroes, we pray that we may be impressed anew with love for our country for whose glory they died. We think of them today with profound respect and are glad to show them honor. For love of country, they follow the flag, and now as they sleep, old glory keeps silent watch over their slumber. Our Father, baptize us anew in love and loyalty for our great country. May we be true to the traditions and heritage of the past. And in final closing, I'm gonna read a brief statement from Levi Longfellow, who also spoke at that first dedication. In honoring the memory of these dead heroes of ours, we are honoring ourselves, our state, and our nation. And we trust that the principles for which they gave their lives will ever be maintained. Where's Billy? We're here. <laughs> 